So good evening, everyone. I take this honor and privilege to share this time with you on discussing a very, very crucial topic, something that is very natural, something that's very physiological to all humankind. And today, this topic that I'll be discussing is about menstruation. So it's been ages that people have been associating menstruation with taboo. There's so many myths associated with it. And we still, in being in the 20th century, despite it, we, we urban people also have to face it in so many uh, negative ways. And uh, there's so many people, girls, adolescents, women, working women, college girls, mm -hmm. school girls in the adolescent age group who have to struggle with this normal phenomenon. When, in fact, menstruation is so very crucial for the normal functioning of a woman and for her to be able to carry out her reproductive function. So I deliberately took up this topic so that it's time that we start talking about it. It's time we educate ourselves and become more aware about it. And there's no reason why any lady, any woman should shy off it. So let's educate ourselves. Let's help other women who come in contact with us. So I, as a doctor, I help my patients through it. I help my housemates through it. I help my daughters and her friends. And I'm going to approach schools wherein girls who are in this primitive age, they need help, uh, especially to understand more about it. So it's my earnest request to all the audience, to all ladies, to all gentlemen sitting out there to help out needy women regarding menstruation and to make it more easier for them to bear it. So ladies and gentlemen, let's give it a start and let's open up with our conversation. So very soon I'll be sharing my slide a little bit about me. I am a fertility super specialist. I've done my MBBS and my MD gynec from the prestigious BJ Medical College, Pune, after which I did my DNP and my super, speciali super specialization in reproductive medicine, that is in infertility. And this was done from Bangalore with Dr. Kamini Rao's Institute. I'm now a super specialist consultant with Cloud9 Hospital, Shivaji Nagar. And I also have my private clinic, my OPD at Baner, wherein I'm available as much as possible for the need of patients and to help them out and to be for them. So practicing fertility and being in the field of fertility makes it very necessary for me to understand everything about menstruation and making others understand it. So that's why I have chosen this topic today for our interaction. Let's get started with my presentation. Yes, so ladies and gentlemen, menstruation matters. And fortunately enough, it matters for every human living being who's there on this planet Earth. It matters equally enough for the men as much as it matters for women kind of all age groups. And why not? Because we are all living on this planet Earth only because normal menstruation took place. Because menstruation is the gateway for any woman to lead a healthy reproductive life. It's a vital sign of a normal reproductive functioning. And hence, it should be looked upon with pride and dignity. It, it has its own share of grace and pride and dignity. And definitely should not be looked upon with shyness, with shame, or with constraint. So let's start today's session. So ladies, we need to talk. And it's not just the ladies. It's the men also. It's the people of all age groups who need to educate themselves, become more aware about what all about menstruation is. And of course, when we talk about women empowerment, it's very essential for women to realize that she needs to know why menstruation happens. How does it happen? How is it helping her? 
and what are the different menstrual problems that can be easily understood that can be easily tackled a lot many times when a woman doesn't get her menstrual cycles regularly she looks upon herself with inferiority and similarly is the opinion of her family members who refuse her who look down upon her so there are few menstrual problems that can be most of the menstrual problems in fact can be very easily tackled <coughs> it just needs understanding and probably a few medications so this is what i'm here for today to make you all understand the minor and the major issues involving the menstrual history so ladies and gentlemen please try to understand a normal female reproductive tract so there is the uterus in which the baby grows and it has a lining so the uterus lining is called as the endometrium uh, this endometrium grows rather strong it grows in thickness in size the glands grow the tissues over there grow so that the baby is able to sit and implant over there and grow for the complete 9 months now next to the uterus are both the ovaries inside the ovaries the eggs are produced that is the follicles are produced and every month roughly mid cycle so if a menstrual cycle if the duration of a, a cycle length is say roughly 28 to 30 days the ovulation happens around the 10th 11th or the 12th day and when this egg release or when the ovulation happens the egg gets transmitted inside and if at all there has been a sexual intercourse the sperms reach there the eggs and the sperms unite they form an embryo and that embryo is brought down to the uterine cavity for sitting and for giving a life to a uh, a birth <coughs> hence the ovaries the uterus the tubes and the various ho hormones which are controlling the functioning of these various organs and these various functions all this happening in a very regulated very coordinated manner is extremely crucial it's a very complex phenomena so when ovulation happens that is when the egg released the uterus is getting ready to establish a pregnancy so the endometrium lining is at its thickest most that's when the endometrium lining grows in thickness roughly to a size of 7 8 sometimes even 12 and 13 14 mm now if there is no pregnancy right all this endometrium after a few days because of the hormones not supporting it will get shed out right as menstrual bleeding so just have a look at these images which my slides are showing that the endometrium thickens up and when there is no pregnancy this endometrium lining gets shed out and it comes out of the vagina in the form of blood so what actually is the menstrual cycle it is a regular discharge or expulsion of blood which majorly consists of the endometrial tissue lining so that gets expelled from the uterus from an age of the girl when she achieves her puberty and it lasts over for the next 30 to 40 years until she reaches menopause except when she is pregnant so menstrual cycles will not be there when a lady is pregnant so it's an absolute normal or a natural body function and it's in fact a vital sign of good reproductive health yet many females across rural and urban india struggle to manage this monthly occurrence there is a taboo or there are so many myths associated with it and it's high time that in the 21st century we all start debunking these menstrual myths and drive away those taboos and don't live with it and let not others live with it there's so many taboos that usually a girl thinks herself to be associated with at the time of menstruation like don't attend religious functions or don't visit religious places don't enter the kitchen don't touch cooking vessels don't cook don't go to school don't touch others don't eat certain types of food don't drink water from a common source and so on and so forth 
And this leads to loss of dignity. This leads to an inferiority complex. This leads to shame. This makes her feel that something is wrong with her. And all these bizarre rules have been laid down years and years ago and decades ago. So in those times and since then, we have been carry carrying along these burdens. There's so much rooted in superstition and it's high time that we drive them away. The myths and taboos, as I have said before, damages self-confidence or esteem. It brews a culture of silence, shame, and constraint. In fact, if a lady does not take care of herself during, during these menstrual cycles in, a, in the most hygienic matter, manner, there is a risk of infection. <coughs> There's also a risk that she might hamper her reproductive potential. So many girls avoid going to schools on those days. They deny or they, they keep themselves from talking about it to others, discussing it with their parents, going to medical help, or discussing it with friends, as a reason of which it has been proven that a numerous school dropouts take place. And hence, a lady prevents herself from achieving full potential. <coughs> the statistics regarding this are very dismal. Almost 88% of girls and women who menstruate use unsafe materials. 66% of girls are unaware of menstruation before they get it. 70% mothers think periods are dirty. 66% girls and women manage periods without toilets in their homes. So it becomes so complex. It's a shame that we all have to live with this trauma and women around us who help us, who are so essential for the normal human beings and the ecosystem to function on this earth. It's a shame that half our population is witnessing these problems. Isn't it our duty to drive away those taboos, to help them solve these matters complex and make it simple for them? <coughs> Hence, my dear friends, menstrual myth. It is high time that we get let go of that burden upon us. Let's break the barriers. Let's break the vicious circle of menstrual taboo. Let's help women reclaim the lost freedom. Let's respect and uphold her dignity. So awareness is very, very crucial. And hence, this is where we start. Let's talk periods. Let's stop with the whispering. And let's be bold and educate ourselves about it because it's very essential for the existence of a future generation. <clears throat> Please go through this slide, ladies and gentlemen. It's talking about the hormones which mainly control the functioning of the menstrual cycle. <clears throat> so these stimulus is coming right from the brain the hypothalamus and the anterior which are parts of the brain. They are giving signals to the ovary to produce certain hormones like the estrogen and the progesterone, which then act on the uterus to produce the uterine lining and also to produce the egg release called as the ovulation. So various hormones are very delicately and in a very coordinated manner. They are interlinked with each other, which will help in egg release, that is the ovulation, and simultaneously, when the egg release takes place, the uterine lining also gets established. So these two cycles are going hand in hand, and a very close coordination between them is very essential. So as the uterine lining develops, the ovulation takes place, and if there is pregnancy, the endometrium continues to get thickened up. But if there is no pregnancy, despite there being an egg release or the ovulation, the endometrium lining, which, were, which had built up inside the uterus, gets shed out after a few days when the hormonal supply is withdrawn. Mm -hmm. And that uterine endometrium lining gets shed out as menstrual blood flow. So menstrual cycle is like the from the onset of one menstrual bleeding phase to the onset of the next menstrual bleeding phase. So the cycle can be divided into the initial few days of menstruation, <clears throat> followed by the follicular development phase, 
Finally, the follicular rupture phase, that is the ovulation. The luteal phase, wherein the ruptured egg, the released egg, fertilizes with the sperms, and the uterine lining also gets developed. And in case if there is no pregnancy, that uterine lining has to get shed off so that the lady is ready for her next cycle. So this is the similar pictorial depiction of a 28-day menstrual cycle, wherein there's the bleeding phase, the follicular phase, the ovulation phase, and the luteal phase, wherein different hormones are involved at different phases to enable all these things to happen in a very smooth and coordinated manner. Now, let's talk about what is the meaning or what comes into the paradigm of a normal menstrual cycle. So many women think that my doctor, my cycle doesn't come on 28 days. So which means that it is abnormal. So my dear friends and Sakia, please understand that it is an exact 28 days cycle for only 15% of women. The rest 85% of the women who are completely normal will can have their menstrual cycles in the range of from 21 days to 36 days. So I would like to say this again and again, that when your menstrual cycle comes after every 21 days earliest, or say even up to 36 days, it is still normal for her. Do not consider yourselves to be abnormal and take the blame of various things or various events happening around you. Don't take the blame onto you, right? What is the average duration of the menstrual reading? So an average, on an average, the flow of blood lasts from two to seven days. So even two days is normal and even seven days is normal, right? So there's so many patients who come or normal ladies who come and walk in and, you know, showing concern or they are brought in by their in-laws or the husbands bring them and they say that doctor, she's getting her periods only for two days. And there's so much of guilt that is going around and so much of politicizing of the issue. So a bleeding of even two days, if she gets in an adequate flow, an adequate amount, it is good enough to be called as a normal menstrual cycle. The normal estimated blood loss is approximately 20 to 80 ml. Now, how do we measure as a common lady? Simply, to, in, in, in simple words, it is to say that if the menstrual bleeding is so much in excess that she's unable to carry out her normal routine activities, it will be said to be an excess. That is, it is a, a too much of a blood loss for her, for which she needs to consult a gynecologist and get herself checked. Now, when does ovulation happen? So if it's a 28-day cycle that is regularly happening for that particular lady, it is said that ovulation happens 14 days prior to her next menstruation, which is usually day 14. Right? Now, if a lady is getting her cycles every 35 days. The menstruation is going to happen 35 minus 14, which is the 21st day. Okay, so this is how a lady needs to first find out what is her average length of menstrual cycle and calculate her day of ovulation. Right now, how many women, um, how many menstrual cycles are there in a lifetime? Almost 300 to 400 menstrual cycles are there for any given lady in her reproductive lifespan. How many eggs does a birth have at female? A female has about 2 million eggs at birth. And they gradually reduce by the time she reaches puberty, which is about 3 to 4 lakhs. And then from puberty onwards, at every month, one of those eggs is going to be reduced. And the remaining active follicles of that particular month are going to get perished. So that is how the three to four lakh eggs which were there at the time of puberty is going to get used up by the time that lady reaches menopause. Now, ladies and gentlemen, for the dear audience who's sitting here, please try and understand how does pregnancy happen. So getting a successful pregnancy for any normal couple is like, you know, cracking the code or solving a jigsaw puzzle perfectly at the very right time. So please try to understand that for humans, the chance of getting pregnant in one particular month is hardly about 10 to 15%. So despite she being completely normal, there is still about 85% chances that there will be no pregnancy. And of course, 
50% of the responsibility of giving a pregnancy is shared by the male partner, that is by the husband, and 50% is shared by the female partner, right? So uh, it's very crucial for us to understand how pregnancy takes place. When this ovulation phenomena takes place, that is from the follicle, when an egg is released, the egg is captured by the fallopian tube. And this fallopian tube then transmits it, transports it. Now, inside the fallopian tube, when the sperms have entered via the vagina, via the cervix, and into the uterine cavity, the sperms have their own motility and they are traveled up. They're made to move up. So a multiple good number of probably millions number of sperms reaches that single egg which has released at the time of ovulation. A number of sperms hover around that mature egg. And finally, any one sperm is able to penetrate it and cause the fertilization. After this fertilization, after the penetration of this sperm, no other sperm will be able to enter that egg. So it's one egg and one sperm which has unified. The next day, the, in, after the union, the further events of the embryo formation or the baby formation take place. That is, the single unified egg and sperm form then divides. So the one cell forms two cells, two forms four. There is cleavage, as you can see. And this all takes place inside the fallopian tubes. The four cells form eight cells. The eight form 16 cells. And finally, a good quality advanced multiple cell embryo is formed. That embryo is then shown the way into the uterine cavity. So it is this endometrium lining which has increased because of the hormones which have got secreted by the eggs and by the ovaries. So the estrogen hormones which is released helps the endometrium tissue to become thick and well developed. And now this becomes an appropriate site for the embryo to stick onto. So if an embryo comes and if everything is good and if the lady is lucky, if the couple is lucky, the embryo gets attached and gets sits and gets enveloped by the endometrial layers. Okay, so this is 10 to 15% in one particular month is the chance that everything will go perfect and pregnancy will happen. If embryo is formed, or if there were no sperms to start with, the egg dies and the uterine lining does not get the continuous later pregnancy hormones which need to be there. And so the uterine lining flows out in her next menstrual cycle as menstrual bleeding. <clears throat> so, my today's talk is aimed, the motto is to educate, to help out, to understand normal physiology as much as possible. So I'm gonna talk about various topics. We spoke about menstrual cycle and how it happens. I'm also now gonna tell the different signs of ovulation. So how does a lady realize that she's ovulating? So this is useful. This bit of information is useful for those ladies who are trying to stay pregnant, those wives who want to stay pregnant. And it's also important for those who do not want to stay pregnant. So if you recognize the sign of ovulation that is happening and you want to stay pregnant, you should have your sexual contact in those few days. Or if she doesn't want to stay pregnant, then she should avoid an unprotected sexual intercourse around the time of ovulation, right? So, to empower you, my dear women, let us now discuss what are the different common signs of ovulation. There is a rise in the basal body temperature. The breasts may become tender. There is an ovulation pain that is the rupture of the follicle. The cervical mucus becomes very thin, very light, and very clear. It can be easily stretched without breaking. There is an increased sexual urge, which actually drives naturally the woman to have a good sexual contact. And certain tests also help a lady to find out. So there are urine tests, that is the ovulation kits, which help her to find out whether she's ovulating or no. So this was the cervical mucus that I was trying to say, that the cervical mucus becomes very thin, and watery, and very clear, and she feels wet. So wet days is a clear sign that ovulation is happening, and she should try to have a sexual contact if she wants to stay pregnant around this time. On the other days, when the ovulation is not happening, when she's not fertile, the mucus that comes out, either it is not there or it is thick 
or it is very scanty it cannot be stretched and it is opaque it is not watery now coming to the common menstrual problems which are female sisters mothers friends daughters have to face okay so please try and understand some women do not have any symptoms at all that may still be normal and there are some women who face symptoms which is still normal so it is normal enough to face or not face any symptoms do not judge yourself just by the presence of symptoms so there are many times patients who come to me saying the doctor i do not get any symptoms of ovulation or i do not have any menstrual problems whereas my friends have a lot of menstrual problems so does that mean that i'm not fertile right so my dear friends please do not judge your fertility with the symptoms that you have at the time of the menstrual cycle so the very symptoms that can be there at the time of menstrual cycle are breast pain bloating menstrual cramps that is stomach ache mood swings that is feelings of irritation or depression disappointment irritability fatigue and and a change in her uh, uh the motions that is the constipation or occurrence of diarrhea also other women face a lot of other issues also so the other <clears throat> menstrual related symptoms are change in appetite as i said just body ache sensitivity to light smell acne clumsiness lethargy sleep problems anxiety tension decreased interest in usual activities loss of libido that is the loss of sexual urge sweating asthma difficulty in concentration low self esteem feeling tearful feeling of bloating headache migraine nausea vomiting irritability and breast tenderness so this is the pictorial uh, demonstration showing these various symptoms okay so almost every any part of the body may get affected and mind you these are all because of the various hormones and the surge of or the fluctuations or the changes in hormones which are occurring at this time of ovulation or even at the time of menstrual cycles it's very normal to feel it and do not blame yourselves or don't get typecast as uh, you are the one who is having too many menstrual problems it is very natural to feel it okay so now i'm going to move on to menstrual pain or dysmenorrhea so there are some women who especially the adolescents or the younger age group who have a lot of menstrual pain or cramps inside um, here abdomen at the time of menses this is called as dysmenorrhea and let's understand more about it so why do menstrual cramps occur now it's a very very normal phenomena to even face menstrual cramps or even not to face menstrual cramps so again do not judge yourself uh right menstrual cramps may occur for various reasons uh in one uh, part of it that is the primary dysmenorrhea it's just natural uterine contractions because of a prostaglandin secretion where the uterus is contracting because it wants to shed out the uterine lining and there are other types of severe dysmenorrhea wherein there is some problem with her uterus because of which so much of pain is happening like it could be because the uterus has polyps or fibroids or it is stuck up somewhere there are pelvic adhesions or there is endometriosis that is inflammations of the glands inside the ovaries so uh, if it is too much uh, that is the dysmenorrhea is too much you can use certain home remedies you can eat certain good foods that you like you should try to listen to music you should try and exercise a bit because it releases the positive or the happy hormones right you should also have a good diet exercise drink lots of water it is also very safe to use medications like the simple prostaglandin inhibitors like mephtalspas tablet you know prostaglandin inhibitors which release this pain it is very very safe to use these medications even two to three times a day um but if there is a continuous need to use these medications i would also re always recommend that you visit a good gynecologist you get yourself assessed by doing a good sonography of the pelvis either a transvaginal or a transabdominal sonography to make sure that nothing is wrong with the uterus and it is just normal physiological dysmenorrhea for which taking those medications is fine <clears throat> because if there are some other causes associated because of which the pain is happening of course 
the management or the treatment will move on or get diverted to other more effective measures rather than just depending on simple medical treatment so do get yourselves assessed if the problem is too much right so the other problems that may occur for women are excess uterine bleeding okay or abnormal kinds of uterine bleeding so what kind of uterine bleeding is abnormal if it happens in between her periods or it happens after the sexual intercourse or there is spotting that is occurring just any time of the menstrual cycle right or the bleeding is heavy it's for few, it's for more days or there is passage of heavy clots or uh, if uh, It is too much that she is unable to carry out her normal routine activities, and also bleeding after menopause. So these are the absolutely normal that a period gets late or it gets delayed by a few days. Okay, so it doesn't necessarily mean that something is horribly wrong with you, right? so few causes why menses can get delayed or why they come a little late than your expected date is because you have lost too much of weight or more commonly you have put on too much of weight so weight gain causes or hormonal mismatches because of which the periods can come late also if there is too much of stress in terms of mental stress or too much of physical activity or when a lady is around her menopausal age right or if she is not been sleeping too much too well or if she is breastfeeding um or also during adolescence that is uh, when a, a girl has just achieved her menarche um when the menstrual normal system is still not set in normally so this is also the time when menses may not come exactly on the same day and they may get delayed by a few days uh, also if she has been ill for uh, pretty seriously for quite a long duration or also if uh she is on some medication so these are the also the other causes why menses can get delayed so do not necessarily presume that something is really abnormal it is perfectly normal for a normal lady to have slightly delayed menses so you should not get worried about it probably just observe a few more cycles and if every month uh say for the you know couple of months two to three months if the same problem is recurring then i think you need to visit a gynecologist <clears throat> now ovarian cysts there's so much of horror in the mind of women regarding ovarian cysts okay so let me just burst this cyst horror so cysts my dear friends occur normally in a normal lady during her reproductive span it can happen in number of times okay so it is very common to get cysts there are different kinds of cysts there are simple cysts follicular cysts retention cysts corpus luteal cysts hemorrhagic cysts right so all these cysts are the normal cysts <coughs> they just contain a little bit amount of fluid or blood inside them which will get absorbed in a few days you don't even need to take any medications for them you just probably you have detected it because you did a sonography and you saw that there is a cyst so if it's of a normal average size of say up to 3 4 cm it is still fine you need not worry so much about it they usually disappear you just got to know that you had a cyst because you did the sonography had you not done the cyst had you not done the sonography the cyst would have disappeared right on its own without you even getting to know about it so do not worry too much about ovarian cysts of course there are certain kinds of cysts which um are not normal so they have a lot of thick dark collected old blood inside them these are called the endometriotic cysts or the chocolate cysts and these are definitely abnormal they need treatment both medical or surgical and they may create problems with your fertility or they may cause too much of menstrual pain so these needs certain kinds of treatment so it's a simple sonography in the hands of a trained sonologist a trained gynecologist who does her own scans or a trained fertility specialist who does her own scan 
will be easily be able to differentiate whether it's a normal cyst or an abnormal cyst and treatment is also very easy so please do remove the horror of the ovarian cysts from your mind and it's very normal to get these cysts right my dear friends right so um, another thing that a lot of we women have to face during our menstrual cycles are mood changes and um pretty often we have to face a lot of uh, flack or you know we we get um looked upon in a very um funny manner because uh, of the manifestation of these mood swings mood swings so it's not a joke it is after all just a hormonal display of the various changes which are occurring inside you is pretty normal to have these mood swings so try to understand that it's normal try to help yourself you are your best friend and um uh, you should help yourself to reduce this anxiety the irritability and the mood swings that are happening after all it's all due to hormonal fluctuations and wherein there is a drop of serotonin so just help yourself talk to somebody talk to a friend eat something good and um, exercise or do certain mental relaxation techniques which is going to mentally ease you out it is also said that certain aroma oils may help or drinking certain kinds of tea may help eating ginger may help pop in your multivitamin tablets you can have some dark chocolates eat healthy food of course keep yourself happy to handle the mood swings now coming to the next important topic of menstrual hygiene and when i when i was preparing preparing for this talk my dear friends ladies and gentlemen i am utterly moved i am totally sensitized to this topic of menstrual hygiene because it was very very tough for me to you know go into the depths and uh, think about the difficulties that girls adolescents college students women poor women have to face um uh, challenges regarding menstrual hygiene especially when you do not have the adequate facilities for it so there is no access to um menstrual you know uh, products uh, pa either pads tampons are not adequately available water is not available around the clock or there are no bathrooms in certain people's homes or the too many people inside the home and it's it's so difficult for her to take care appropriate care of her hygiene or there are financial limitations or she's having heavy menstrual bleeding she's having heavy menstrual pain what is the poor lady going to do so my dear friends it is high time that we all become very sensitive to this topic we treat, we should treat each other as well as ourselves with appropriate care at this time of the menstrual bleeding right so now i'm going to do much more regarding menstrual hygiene and regarding reaching out to adolescents and i'm going to go out into slum areas i'm also going to i'm planning to go into schools and talk to uh, the girls as well as the boys of this age to understand why it's happening that it's not something abnormal it's not something that should be looked upon with shame and disregard okay it does, it it, uh, it deserves a lot of respect and dignity right so <coughs> for all of us to understand the different means the products that we can use at the time of menstrual bleeding are they could be pads they could be cups and also they could be tampons so let us try to learn more about it okay now pad is something that is applied externally um uh, on the underwear and tampons is something that is inserted into the vagina a menstrual cup is also something that is inserted into the lower vagina which collects all this menstrual blood right now each of these products are easily widely available the costs vary okay there are various sizes of these menstrual cups that can be fit and <clears throat> in fact um they uh, they they found to be very convenient by working women especially uh because it's easy to fit it does not cause uh, rashes as the pads cause and it's a very hygienic product and it can be reused so the economy wise also it becomes very friendly so this is uh, a table which is depicting a comparison between these various methods so um uh, the pads can be felt whereas tampons and menstrual cups cannot be felt and uh, 
fats are the ones which cause irritation or dryness whereas tampons and menstrual cups do not there are no chemicals or perfumes especially in the menstrual cups and in fact it can be used even for a longer time the menstrual cups because it is collecting the blood so this particular slide of mine is showing that a cup a menstrual cup can be used for 10 to 12 hours whereas um uh, the sanitary pad can be used for 3 to 6 hours whereas a tampon may be used for 4 to 8 hours so menstrual cup has many many advantages as compared to the other two methods that is it's not loaded with chemicals and it does not cause rashes it can be used for a longer time and there is no problems of even you know bad foul uh, smell that is coming in and um, uh, it's it can be reused and they are also disposable right so this was regarding the menstrual hygiene now coming to the other problems which many women have which is prevalent and these questions are lingering in the minds of many reproductive age group okay especially becoming more common now this is the problem of PCOD. So what is PCOD? It is called as the polycystic ovarian disease or the polycystic ovarian syndrome. So this slide of mine is showing how uh, a normal ovary has about 10 to 15, say 8 to 10 functioning follicles, but a polycystic ovarian syndrome kind of ovary has multiple, much, much, much more than that. Uh, the number of follicles are there. So almost 15 to 20. Because of this excess number of follicles, um, it is very closely linked with hormonal disturbances, normal ovulation not happening, the estrogen, the SF, FSH hormones not coming in at the right time, the surge not taking place, ovulation does not happen. And uh, uh, so because of which even fertility becomes a problem. Also, since ovulation is not happening, her next menstrual cycle does not come on the expected time. And there is a lot of disappointment um, that a lady and the couple goes through. So, because there are so many follicles around over here which are lingering, in fact, they are even called as cysts, where actually they are follicles. So, it is a misnomer, it is called as cysts, right? But they are actually just numerous follicles which are stagnating and which are not growing adequate enough to create ovulation. Um, PCOD being very common um, and it is associated with so many hormonal disturbances. The other symptoms that PCOD women face are hair loss, which is called as alopecia, and excess hair at the unwanted parts, the exposed parts that is on the chin or on the cheeks or on the, uh, the nape of the neck or even on the chest or even on her legs. So excess hair that is there because of the excess male hormones that is present uh, and insulin not working correctly. Pelvic pain may be present. Infertility, of course, is a problem because ovulation is not happening. There may be weight issues because insulin which is a very good metabolic hormone that is not functioning properly. Irregular periods, of course, uh, is very, very common in PCOD women because ovulation, again, is not happening. And fatigue is very common, high testosterone levels. These women also many times have to battle the problems of acne also. Why, again, because hormonal disturbances are there and male hormones, which are normally present in every woman. So these are raised in their levels. Right. I next come to another common gynec topic that many, many women face and uh, is the problem of leukorrhea or white discharge. So please understand, my dear friends, is it's very normal to have normal uh, white secretions. Right. But um, leukorrhea is a condition where there is persistent or excess amount of white discharge, which is causing irritation to you. Okay, which is very sticky, which is foul smelling, which gives you a sense of infection and which is causing irritation or pain or pain during um, uh, it's disturbing your routine activities. So uh, most of the times it is because of infection, could be sexually transmitted infections or other types of infections coming because of bad hygiene, unhygienic living conditions or even because of certain ulcers or wounds at the time of at the, at the area of the cervix or the vagina. And it may also get aggravated when there is uh, anemia or health issues like diabetes that is there, that is raised blood sugar because of infections become very common. Also, it can occur when there are hormonal abnormalities. So these are the various situations where excess white discharge is present. So what you need to do, my dear friends, you please need to visit a good gynecologist where she's going to check you up from inside, do a good vaginal checkup, assess the kind of secretions that has, that is there. Um, and from the appearance itself, it is easy to find out whether it's a yeast or a fungal infection or is it a bacterial infection. And then 
very easy, very, very uh, inexpensive kind of medications are there to be placed vaginally or orally, which very commonly they can tackle very effectively. They tackle these vaginal infections and you can get a good relief. So you need to visit a good gynecologist if you're getting these re recurrent episodes. Also, urine infections or uh, blood sugar levels may have to be assessed. Right. So different kinds of vaginal discharges are there and without too many advanced invasive investigations it is very easy for a good gynecologist to pick up what kind of infection it is give you the right medical treatment and sooner or later within a few uh, days your infection will be tackled so these were about the very common uh, gynac problems that ladies have to face and um, it was my earnest and my humble and my honest attempt to cover as many common gynac problems as possible time is limited hence uh, it's a restraint for me to go on. Otherwise, it would be my pleasure. If you all want to connect to me, you can please post your questions. <coughs> um, you can post your questions in uh, the comment section over here. And uh, I'll be happy to answer your questions. Also, I'm the fertility specialist at Cloud9 Hospital. I have my clinic at Bhale Rao Clinics. Vanir Pune, my contact number is 9421759341. And you can always connect with me if you have um, any major issues for which you need the, you feel the need to talk to someone, to discuss with your problems. And not, there are very few problems. There are very few symptoms which are actually major problems. Most of the times it's just variation of the normal. So this thin line of differentiation between normal and abnormal needs to be done. And for which you need to understand yourself, your body, and you need to contact the right person. Thank you very much. And I'll be looking forward to a good interaction with you through this comment section or through the chat section, where in which you can answer your questions. I will be available for the next 10 minutes or so. If there's anybody who has questions, please pose them. I am not aware of how the slideshow has gone. And I hope it was a smooth transition. Yes, so we are here to receive certain questions and it's my honor that I'll be able to help you out. So we have this question uh, which have been posed to us by Missy Tester and she would like to know if bleeding after two years of menopause is normal. So yes, uh, Miss, um, any kind of bleeding which happens after the menopause, that is after the reproductive lifespan is ended, it is not normal. Mm. So you definitely need to get yourself checked up. You need to visit a good gynecologist. And there are various reasons why menstrual bleeding can happen after menopause. It could be some lesion inside the uterus. It could be some mass inside the uterus. It can be some growth that is happening at the cervix or at the vagina. Or it can also be certain hormonal problems. So that's why you need to visit a gynecologist who is going to examine you. Uh, as also a very good internal transvaginal sonography is going to be required to find out what this cause may be. So is there a lesion inside the uterus? What is the endometrium lining? Because after menopause, normally the lining of the uterus, that is the endometrium lining, becomes very thin, hardly two or three millimeters. So in case if the lining is thicker than what it should be, it definitely goes on to say that something is not right. And the endometrium needs to be checked. It needs to be tested. So biopsy may be required to find out if that particular excess endometrium that is growing over there, is it normal? Is it the abnormal type? So bleeding after menopause is definitely not normal. And you do need to get yourself checked. Okay, miss. Uh, we now come upon to our next question uh, posed to us by Zarana. She says her mother has already stopped getting periods 
and her age is 59. But recently, she's getting urine infections very frequently. Yes, Zarana, um, this is an age group. In fact, postmenopausal age group is a very common and a very susceptible age wherein infections are likely. Why? Please understand, because the normal functioning of the ovaries is not there. So the estrogen hormone, uh, the level has reduced quite a lot. So this very low estrogen hormone cannot now maintain the health um, or the integrity of the genital and the urinary tract. Hence, urine infections are also become very common. Also, most of the times at this advanced age group, diabetes may be there, blood sugar, uh, raised blood sugar becomes very common. That is why, again, urine infections become very common. Okay, so um of course you need to take good care of yourself personal hygiene matters a lot you need to cross check whether your blood sugars are normal or no and uh, a urine check is required especially when the urine infections become very common or repeated or recurrent uh, a urine test needs to be done it's a urine routine micro or a urine culture which is going to show that there is some organism that is growing there and accordingly, we can treat it with a good antibiotic to make sure that it should not recur again. Of course, personal hygiene is important. Physical activity is important. Sometimes, only for some women, certain estrogen supplementation may be given. But of course, they're given by doctors, trained and qualified doctors, and not everybody can have it. Right? So you need to meet your doctor and to find out what kind of urine infection, what is the cause of it. Okay? We move on to our next question, which has been posed to us by Jyoti. I once again request all the viewers to please boost our morals because today we have come up with the sole aim of raising public awareness. The sole aim of today's session is that I and the team over here backing me, we all want to improve the awareness among women that Women health is of prime importance. It's time you take your health into your hands. You give it due importance. Take care of your own health. Eat well, exercise well. And the normal hormonal changes that are taking place, <clears throat> right from menarche to menopause, you need to look at it um, uh, in a very sound manner. And uh, you need to understand what the difference between normal and abnormal. You need to help yourself. You need to help each other when it comes to menstrual hygiene and helping them get access to menstrual pads or tampons or menstrual cups and to enable them to use it in a hygienic manner. If there is somebody who is having excess flow, excess blood clots, she needs to meet a gynecologist so that she, the excess blood loss does not take place anemia does not happen otherwise her whole body will have may face different challenges hence we all have to be very delicate very considerate very um affectionate very mm -hmm. empathetic with each other right so i was just about to take up this question um by miss jyoti who would like to know that her teenage daughter uh, has a menstrual cycle after 45 days, is it normal? So yes, Mrs. Jyoti, uh, your daughter is a teen and if she's just about, she has got her menstrual cycle. So when the menstrual cycles begin, that is when puberty has just started in, uh, please try and understand that this, this very close and delicate coordination of so many hormones that are there inside, functioning inside, that that normalcy is still not set in. Hence, Ovulation may not happen at the start and you give, have to give time for her body to get used to these kind of, you know, hormonal changes um, that are happening. Hence, you have to realize that at the start, not every menstrual cycle may be of 28 to 30 days, 45 days may be normal for her because probably the ovulation is not happening, right? So we need to give in some more time. And as long as you make sure that after a few years or maybe a few months, her cycles do become regular and her weight is normal and her thyroid issues are normal, this is what you need to ensure about. So good assurance, good empathetic approach and, and a feeling of positivity, a sense of positivity that you share with her 
is very crucial at this juncture to help her realize that it is completely normal, right? Uh, there is another very common question that is being posed to us by Cheryl Thomas. And the question that she asks is, is there any permanent cure for PCOS? So uh, yes, Ms. Cheryl, uh, uh, sadly speaking, there is no permanent cure for PCOS. PCOS is something that you're born with, plus the genetics is such that it is manifesting it. So it is just that you are, um, you are predestined to have the PCOS, but of course, you know, uh, limiting its symptoms or controlling it, keeping it under control is very much in your hands. So you can do that by exercising, by having very good physical activity regularly, consistently over a long period of time so that your weight does not increase. And along with it, the diet uh, that you should, you know, help yourself out with, that is have a low carbohydrate, low calorie diet, make sure that you're not eating too much of empty calories because all that excess fat that you put on over there is going to enhance the hormonal disturbance that's taking place. Hence, uh, PCOS can be very well controlled with your diet uh, and with your physical activity, with a good exercise. Also, there are lots of medications which help us control the hormonal disturbance. So controlling it is common, is possible, but cure may not be possible, right? We have a next question that has come up by Ms. Shweta. What are the problem, common problems faced once menopause sets in and how to tackle it? Yeah, the common problems uh, which the menopausal aged women have to face again is mood swings because um, the estrogen support is withdrawn. So um, estrogen has, normally has a very good and supportive influence on the heart, the bone strength, and uh, the lining of the urinary tract, the genital tract, the vagina, the cervix. So estrogen normally has a very good effect on it. So once this estrogen gets withdrawn, when menopause sets in, um, cardiac symptoms may increase and uh, there could be recurrent urine, urine problems, infections. There could be frequency or urgency of urine. There could be vaginal infections, atrophic vaginitis, and people may have pruritus or you know recurrent infections around that area. Also, uh, wrinkling of the skin becomes common. Mood swings are very common. And um, so uh, this especially happens even before menopause sets in. So uh, try to understand that uh, th there's no complete cure for it. But of course, you can keep it in control by being physically active, by being mentally active, by trying various forms of relaxation techniques, um, uh, like doing pranayama, and uh, meditation, yoga, to improve the oxygen availability in the blood. Um, also, a good healthy diet is important so that you do not add in or add on too much of weight. A good cardiac checkup, good granite checkup, at least once a year is important. Breast cancers are also very common at this age. Hence, you should do your mammographies once every year. You should do your pap smears once every two or three years. And you should also get your ECG done uh, once every year. Okay, so these are the various ways in which you can decently and in a dignified manner uh, handle the menopausal symptoms. Also, it's very crucial to get good family support, talk to your friends, talk to women of the same age group, and uh, so that you discuss and you feel, you realize that you're not the only one sailing in the boat. And um, these common, uh, these problems are more prevalent than you would think them to be. Okay, Mrs. Sh uh, Shweta, I hope that answers your question. I am more than eager to answer all your questions, which you can post in your in the comments section. And if not possible now, we would like to. Uh, I would try my level best to reach out to you sooner or later to answer all your queries and um, to make you feel as normal as possible, to make you realize that we need to take good care of ourselves. We need to understand that our health is very important for the good health of our family, right? So I hope you like this session. I hope it helps you. I hope it encourages the feelings of kindness, generosity, understanding, compassion, and empathy 
of or, and also women empowerment and the compassion that women feel towards each other to help out each other in times of needs so i definitely am going to be more compassionate with my patients of course but also with my maids with neighbors with friends and make them realize that it's these are all normal phenomena and we need to look upon even the menstrual cycle with more dignity thank you dear friends and i hope it's been an interesting session for you i would like to come back with more interesting sessions if you have any suggestions please type it for us in the comment section we will now like to end this broadcast session thank you everyone again it's been an honor for me thank you